No, in this session is not a uh, question, it's a case presentation and the uh, panel will uh, discuss the cases. And I understand that pelvic fall is difficult to understand and difficult to approach. And so that's why we bring up many cases of pelvic fall for discussion. Okay, we start the first case. Who will be the first one? I don't know. Who's presenting? There are someone presenting. Okay, there are many, many presenters. Okay, good, af good afternoon. Uh, this case starts from, uh, from Bangladesh International Hospital. So, uh, this case from Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> the story starts from five, five years ago. Uh, she is a female, 24 years old, from Bangladesh. And uh, five years ago, she has the anal fissure present in, in, in Bambungrat Hospital and with anal pain and intermittent bleeding per rectum. And she has a constipation, sense of incomplete evacuation, and uh, has to go to the toilet many times to empty uh, the stool around 16 to 18 times a day. And after she had bowel movement, she feel severe anal pain, and she has to use her finger to uh, evacuate, evacuate the stool. And sometimes she has to use the water hose to irrigation. Uh, she spent around 20 minutes in each uh, toilet visit. So we can stop here? Oh, okay, okay, next. No, 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 no. Only, only okay. history. And her stool is uh, described that it's soft, and she passed mucus sometimes. For physical examination, uh, we found chronic anal fissure with a uh, white base and uh, the digital rectal examination, examination we cannot do because uh, of pain. This is of the uh, history and physical examination. So, in the panel, any panels uh, what to discuss what's next? What we want to investigation? Anyone want to investigation something? Okay. Oh, uh, discussion the the case. Okay. Uh, do we have any gynae history or obstetric history? No. <coughs> Nothing. She, she is. You mean obstetric? Naliparis. She in Naliparis. Okay. And any anything uh, any sort of um, uh, childhood issues? No. After she was born, was there, were there any issues they, they uh, did we contact? We don't have history about that thing. You don't have the history. And, and is there any injury to the, her back? Yes. Like, does she ha has any back surgery, back pain? No, no, no history of any trauma. <laughs> and, and did she remember why, when the, the first time the symptom occurred? Is there any, anything that make her... Mm -hmm. She does, doesn't mention anything about that. Uh, does he have the, she have the, some treatment ab about the fissure? After the fissure treatment, does she still have the symptoms? Uh, actually, uh, these symptoms start around six years ago, and she got um, many treatment in Bangladesh. Most of the treatment is uh, only medical treatment. Uh, never, get, never, never got any surgery for the anal fissure. And uh, uh, this patient has some like uh, uh, sexual issue, also have some psychological problem of the pelvic floor. Uh, about that issue, I, I don't have the information. Any other uh, questions or uh, what? Well, any other questions you want to get from history? Because you know uh, the age; she's only 24. It's not very common to have a pelvic or obstructive defecation syndrome at such a young age normally in a Nelly Paris. I don't know. Do you see, is it common to have uh, in this young age uh, obstetric defecation uh, syndrome? So probably it could have been triggered by the fissure. The fact that the fissure is there, that could have triggered off this. So uh, 
uh, you said that the examination was not done, but I think apply after applying some lidocaine jelly or something, it's usually possible to do. So at least we know the anal tone, you know, and then further investigations to be done uh, after that. Uh, I, I would like to ask some questions about history. Why she used uh, digitation, and when she did digi digitation, does she get some stool with uh, with her with the digitation? Yes, Professor Arun answered that that question. Yes, sometimes he need digital evacuation and it, even water enema as well. Yes. I want to pose a question to the panel, okay? Now, the presenter said she has inner fissure and they did not do digital examination because of pain. I want to ask you a question. Then how can the patient do digital examination herself without pain? <laughs> now, first question. Secondly, if the patient can do digital examination, cannot, can the doctor not do digital examination as well? So that's a question I ask the panel. I, I think I agree with you. It's, I mean, uh, considering all this and the fact that he, she's this thing, I, that's why I said you can always apply lidocaine jelly and do a rectal examination. That's always possible. You get a lot of information. You know the tone of the muscle, whether the spasm is there, whether, you know, other things. So the, 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 the first thing, I mean, this is my, as a moderator, I want to pose this to you and see whether you agree or what you want else to do. The first thing I think is that the fissure is a red herring because the fissure may be there. They are probably, and we are not told whether this is, uh, this is they say this is acute chronic fissure, white is based. But it may be just, uh, you know, a, a consequence of her digging and because of her straining. So this is not the cause, but it's the effect. So I want to ask the panel whether you agree with this. If, you're not, if you don't agree with this, then what is your um, thinking? And also, what is the next thing you want to do for this patient? So, I, I just give my opinion. I think the, as Francis rightly said, when you digitally evacuate, you get that, you know, little fibrosis and the, uh, the whitish uh, color what you have, uh, that is basically not, because fissure usually we don't see a whitish base like thing. It's you, usually you after mean, the, You mean that this fissure come from repeat evacuation? Yes. So, it's basically a, a uh, the thickening of the uh, anal mucosa, basically, the white mucosa. Oh, yeah. I give you more information because I, I see this occasion. Uh, after that, she got uh, anal fissure surgery in Bangladesh, not from our hospital. And then he come there later, is the, the wound heal. The, the fissure in that area has healed. So this should be a true fissure. So it's basically a digital evacuation causing that fibrosis. No, but I even the fissure heal with fissure surgery doesn't mean it was, it was a true or not a true fissure. Because fissures, especially acute fissures, they still heal. And I think it's not easy to examine the patient if you don't, do a, if you don't actually part properly or you don't do a finger examination. If you're looking, sometimes there is some slough, as you say, or some mucus, and you can't really see whether it's a fissure or not a fissure clearly in the clinic if you don't do digital examination. Okay, next, what is the investigation you want to do? The panel, any investigation? Actually, uh, we need like uh, talk uh, with the patient very carefully because uh, like because this is actually that uh, patient maybe have some stress and anxiety. Uh, it's very common in China now, recently because uh, she's young, but she still have um, more than 10 times for the defecation one day. That's uh, actually from the psychological or psychiatric, we need to have some evaluation uh, for her, yeah. It means that the first time maybe some stool and the next time mucus, mucus, and mucus. What, what, what maybe each of you can give. What's the next investigation you want? I, w I, would, I would like to do her uh, anal manometry, actually. The first thing I would like to do is anal manometry. So, so I think that the point is that if the patient has fissure or any pain in the anus, you should not put the, your finger in. And if now it's only here, you can do the complete digital rectal examination. So I would check if there is uh, any mucosal lesion 
and we can ask her to do the con contraction. We measure the resting, squeezing pressure, and we ask her to push down and see whether there is an internal prolapse or any distance of the pelvic floor, uh, anything in, inside. Okay. April? Um, just, just thinking laterally, I'd, I'd really like to make sure that this patient doesn't have something organic like Crohn's, you know, coming, coming from the Indian Seaweed. subcontinent, being a young female, presenting with a lot of these sort of uh, uh, nebulous GI symptoms. I'd, I'd want to rule out something like Crohn's. Uh, for me, I need a manometry if possible, and then digital rectal examination, and then if possible, I need a, some kind of difficulty <laughs> because she presented with a constipation, obstructification, and feature. It seemed like a, a typical feature. Uh, Dr. Tibilak, you haven't said anything. Very quiet. Um, <laughs> because from the history, she has the problem with obstructive defecation. Of course, there is a uh, chronic anal fissure is the result of the, the obstructive defecation. So uh, if she has no pain, and then per rectal examination will give you a lot of information about the uh, paradoxical um, uh, contraction, whether or not it's there. And another thing that we're going to do is the anal rectal manometry, because it will give us a lot of information, whether it's there a her spoon, which we can see later in the uh, early adult, or is there any problems with the contraction of the muscles. And other things that we need to do is, because she passed the mucus, we need to do the colonoscopy to rule out any possible cause of inflammation or uh, inflammatory bowel disease. I, actually, I want to give my opinion, because this is Dr. Arun's patient, so he knows. No. You might, no, no, no. But you know everything. So uh, this sort of patient, it comes to my practice. Actually, she started, the situation started when she was 18 years old, right? So a lot of young girls, 18 years old, they want to be slim, they want to be beautiful, they start, go on a high fiber diet. This is the start of the problem. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I see so many of this. I don't belabor the point, but this is what happens. When they go on high fiber diet, they get big bulky stools, they start straining and then they can't evacuate properly, and then they get mucosa prolapse, they get swelling in mucosa, and they get fissure, and this problem starting. You know, so often, often a very simple dietary uh, questioning and what happened, and also what I do is, what I do is, I agree with colonoscopy, but what I do is, I tell them, I, I give them bowel prep, I evacuate everything, I tell them go on a no fiber diet for three weeks. No fiber at all, no veggie, no fruits, no cereal. They take white bread, white rice, normal amount of meat. I see them in three weeks. If they're totally healed, then we know this is a problem. Then I say, from now onwards, take just a little bit or whatever you like, but don't take fiber. And then they are, a lot of them are cured. I see so many of these, they are cured. Totally cured without any more investigation, without any more surgery. Okay, next. So Francis, are you inadvertently prescribing them a low FODMAPS diet? Low what? Low FODMAPS diet. I, no, I, I, I see, to me, I tell all my patients, fiber is junk food. <laughs> because fiber you eat cannot be digested. So I explain to them carefully, I tell them to go on an experiment for three weeks. That's what I do. Okay, Francis, so we talk about the uh, no fiber. And our practice, we use fiber. So in my practice, because he is my teacher, I believe him, but I still believe the book. <laughs> so in my practice, I always say like this, and he, I always explain to the patients, every patient responds differently. So you try high fiber diet. If it's good, continue. If it's not good, stop and you try low fiber diet. If you do not eat any fiber and you are very good, then do not eat fiber anymore. So I told them that each patient respond differently. So I do not fix idea. I believe him, I believe, believe in the literature. So I practice both. I, th I, th I think the, I, I must say I agree with Francis because all my patients that come, all these patients have been advised by so many people to have high fiber diet and I just tell them you just eat normal food what everybody else is eating in the house, just eat that 
don't do anything else just eat normal food and i tell you majority of the patients are much much better with uh, okay. uh, that okay never finish is long story <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Uh, you start with at that time we send a uh, mi difficult gram and the picture is like this okay you can say when she push and she uh, relax everything is a uh, doesn't move and the radiologist in the pre that uh, she has the severe spastic pelvic floor syndrome uh, and no pelvic floor relaxation at that time uh, professor run he is the, the the doctor that treat this patient he suggests her to biofeedback first and water enema at that time and the story after that at the end of, uh, of, of that year, she went to Singapore and Bangladesh. Uh, in Singapore, she got uh, anal manometry, and the result was uh, high resting anal pressure, rectal hypersensitivity, uh, and rectal anal inhibitory reflex was present. Uh, sigmoidoscope, she got in Singapore too. Uh, we, uh, they found that she has an ulcer at the distal rectum and opinion from doctor in Singapore is uh, etiology of this problem should be repeat, repeated in touch susception of the rectum and have the trauma of the anterior wall of the rectum resulting in ulcer and fissure may be due to repeated trauma from digitation or use of water hose so in Singapore they uh, he put the botulinum toxin at the internal sphincter. Uh, the total dose of botulinum to toxin at that time is uh, 50 units. Uh, after that, around a few, few months, she went to Bangladesh. And at that time, she got uh, lateral internal sphincterotomy at the end of uh, 2013. So after that, all of the history is missing and she went back to uh, Bambungla International Hospital again on June 2015, so around two years later. Uh, she still complained the same thing, still need finger evacuation, still pain after bowel movement. Uh, but at, at this time for the rectal examination, there is no enough fissure anymore. And we found the gap of the internal sphincter from the sphincterotomy in Bangladesh. Okay, we stop here. We stop here. So from the investigation, maybe from manometry, from the MRI, any impression or any discussion from the panels? So I think uh, she would need biofeedback, basically. Uh, that can definitely help her. So, so I think uh, she is very young and I think she should be asked and about her psychological. I, I agree with the thing that she has some, something inside her mind. Because uh, we found a lot of patients who repeatedly do the digitation by her, himself or herself. And finally, if we can make friends with them and then they can relax. But finally, they don't need anything. They can go back to normal life. Uh, by, but, by, but now, I think uh, I, I would like to discuss a little about fiber. So usually I would, I would ask the patient to make their stool form like bistol stool scale type 4. So usually I then don't ask them to eat the raw fiber, but I think they should do like the vegetable soup. So if it's a soup, it's already minced and blended. So it's easy to it, it make the bamboo pen easier and they absorb water together and then uh, maybe I, I will talk to the patient. Usually I do the manometry by the, myself so I can have time to discuss with them and also the biofeedback. They, she will see the same nurse every time also may, may help. Any other opinion? I think the patient, uh, the same opinion that uh, we need to uh, have the history of the like 
actually like this kind of patient, very young, uh, mostly from the, from the psychological issues. Uh, also, we need to have some history. Actually, the sexual abuse history, we need to know that's, uh, that's from the behaviors. So before the biofeedback, we need to know this. Then the biofeedback also need the cognitive therapy for the patient. Then the biofeedback, they will be good because the, uh, actually the high turn of the internal sphincter it's uh, from the psychological problems. If we do the Botox injection, that's only the first step. But uh, is the panel not worried about this? You see, I think there's two things here. One, we keep talking about psychological problems, but a patient has a solitary rectal ulcer, a big one. So, you know, are we not going concerned about that? Because when that is there, you cannot give them bar feedback, expect it to heal. Also, you cannot tell a patient you've got a psychological problem because there is something, there's an ulcer there, that's why she can't pass, and that's why she feels that she's got this problem. So are you, first of all, my question is, uh, are you happy to just leave the ulcer and treat her uh, with bar feedback and other treatment, or are you going to uh, look at this ulcer, and if you are going to look at this ulcer, in what way are you going to look at this ulcer? This uh, the big ulcer may cause by direct trauma by No, it's very big. All right, it's not like a digital the trauma. The caused by pubic spasm. Yes, likely to be. The solitary rectum, I think there are two possibilities. One from intersection, the other one from obstructification, spastic levator ani, and then you can have big solitary rectum. It's shallow. It had been biopsy, and it's confirmed that it's a solitary rectum. So what's next? Yeah, I want to just say a few things to the panel and then you, you give you up. Because solitary rectal ulcer, you know, when it's present, patients always have a feeling of tenismus because they got swelling, they got pain, they got discharge, and they always feel very bad. So to tell the patients your psychological problem, you know, it's actually unfair for them because they really have, have this problem. Now, secondly, uh, these patients are well before the episode and then they suddenly become worse and worse because they keep straining. Now, I'm not sure about, uh, uh, maybe the females know better. Any female that has cystitis, you know you can't control yourself. You know, you, want to, you, you say, I want, don't want to go to the toilet, but you can't because the feeling is so strong. You know, and these patients, they have this feeling, it's very strong. You tell them, hey, don't go, just control, control. They will die before they can control it. <laughs> so, I want to ask the panel. So, I think... Do we, at this time, the panel think it's more important to treat the solitary rectal ulcer or treat the psychological problem or just send the biofeedback? Or what's your next step? Um, can I? Uh, I do agree with you because she has a history of solitary rectal ulcer. You have to need to look at it and do re-biopsy whether is it really uh, solitary rectal ulcer. Yeah. If there is a, a solitary rectal ulcer, you have to treat the solitary rectal ulcer. Either you give the, you, uh, you give the sulcophate enema to decrease the inflammation and then give the stool uh, laxative to help her to defecate better. What kind of laxative? I, um, laxative, usually we give her uh, bowel forming. Bowel forming? I think this lady try every laxative. And, and not, not only one, and not simple one. He eat a lot of laxative every day, uh -huh. and, but cannot pass the stool. But another, another choice is the retrograde colonic irrigation is the choice that to treat the uh, distal obstruction. She all have uh, enema, cell enema. Yes, she do that. But even enema is difficult to pass out. I, I, I want to ask another question. Okay, sorry for the panel. I want to ask a question. Now, we say the patient has solitary rectal ulcer. We say the patient has constipation, obstructed defecation. But we haven't asked... I mean, I want to ask you a question. Are you not interested to know whether, the, she, whether this feeling of obstruct defecation is feeling, that means it's empty, but she feels it because it's ulcer, there's swelling, or is it because there's a lot of stool inside? Because the two, two things are quite different and treating them is quite different. If the patient has sorterect ulcer and you put the rectal, your finger in and you feel a lot of stools, that is stool. 
But if you put your finger in and you feel empty, which often is the case, then it's not stool. It is not stool. So if you give laxatives, you're aggravating the problem. If you give fiber, you're also aggravating the problem. But if it's full of stool, then there's a different story. So I just... <laughs> but we asked that question right at the beginning. Yeah. We asked when you put the no, finger no. in, is that yeah. stools? We have already asked that question. Fans, so Francis, that is correct. Francis is correct. When they put the finger in, no stool. Yeah. And, and the manometry already showed that she has hypersensitivity because she feels something easy. Like some, even it, it can be the represent of the solitary detector officer it, is it there that make it has cross information and it makes her sensitive or she may already have the underlying hypersensitivity that she try to push uh, or I try to evacuate herself uh, and because now she has already that did the MR difficulty and it looks very normal only all, uh, and then spastic of the pelvic floor and they, she already did the Botox so now if they examine the patient and she already has the relaxed pelvic floor and if I ask her to push down and it's normal so I think uh, I will do the local treatment like Dr. Silak <laughs> said do for like the solitary okay. we all do that but one in interesting point is that Botox injection I would like to ask the panel with your experience about the Botox injection, how much you have to inject, which technique, how can you inject into the water and in the people like that, how can you put it, and how much, and the location which you inject. So, panel, please. As for the Botox injection, as from my experience, that's why we need to use the like uh, EMG needles to guide. That's uh, uh, from the posterior, uh, three points. Posterior, uh, six o'clock, three o'clock, nine o'clock. Uh, then uh, we can test the like uh, needle EMG, we can test the paradoxical contraction then we like the uh, the sound the emg sound is very uh, like per, uh, very high then we can use this the uh, unit uh, from the china the that's a 100 unit uh, for the 1 milliliter selling then so the every uh, point that's uh, uh, 0 0.3 milliliters I had only three cases, so I did bright technique. I use a uh, hundred unit of the Botox at three and nine o'clock. So I did it in the operating theater, operating room under IV sedation. Uh, in my experience, from what I train, we do under general anesthesia, and then we do a hundred unit of Botox injection. We do it inject in the three o'clock and uh, nine o'clock. Uh, before doing it, we do per rectal examination that we palpate the pubic rectoris, and then we inject with it's the needle. Yes, it's blind. Bright. Yes. I've no, I've never used Botox, so I have no experience. Okay, you have any? Yeah, experience. The, the only thing I would add to that is that uh, we would normally do our injections under ultrasound guidance. So you I inject would on ultrasound? So you put in your endorectal ultrasound and uh, then your needle comes from outside and you can actually see the tip of yes, the Yes, from the ultrasound yeah. we can see clearly. Yeah. But in our practice, anyone inject with the ultrasound guide? I, I think I have Dr. Chilawat case if we do this with ultrasound guide. Uh, very good. So we know that there are EMG needle and ultrasound guide. And for the location, I think you inject posteriorly and the other one inject at uh, 3 and 9. So what is the concept? What is the basic idea? See, for Botox, there has never been a consensus that exactly how much to inject, where to inject, even for a fissure, where exactly it should be injected, below the fissure bed or laterally in the intersphincteric space or where. So there has been, everybody has got different... Uh, I, I, actually, I suggest that Botox is totally wrong treatment in this patient. Her problem is a solitary rectal ulcer, not the fissure. So injecting Botox is just a way of making money from her without treating her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But 
Francis, Francis, solitary rectal ulcer is a consequence, it's not the underlying cause. You know, you, it's got to come from somewhere, and if she's constantly straining, it, you know, she was normal before, right? Something started her off straining. Uh, so no, I, I, I have I, to say, I, I disagree with you. I think the SRUS is a, a consequence. No, no I, I, I actually, I don't agree with that. We always say solitary rectal ulcer is a consequence, but we, a lot of patients start with solitary rectal ulcer without any fissure, without any other problems. They start with solitary rectal ulcer, which is the main leading cause. To me, this patient needs treatment for solitary rectal ulcer first. If we can treat her, she'll be cured. No, but I think those uh, which occur uh, on their own, spontaneously, they're usually falling into susception. If they into susception, you can get a solitary rectal ulcer without any of this thing. But in this case, there was no intersusception. So most, mostly, uh, solitary rectal ulcer could have come from digital uh, evacuation. For me, I will try to treat the solitary uh, rectal ulcer first. And if she has no response, you have to look for the cause of the solitary rectal ulcer, whether there is a rectal intersusception or no. there is an um, anismus. MRI is just give. Sometimes it's twenty percent. There is Correct. the wrong information about the okay. rectal prolapse. We okay. discuss a lot, but. At this time, we don't know exactly what is yes. or what are the causes of the solitary yes. rectal ulcer. Yes. So we have only evidence that the MR difficult gram shows yes. spasm. Yes. So we have any choices? We do not know. Yes. No. Correct. But, but you, you mentioned that she already take a lot of uh, laxative. So I think we may have to look back into the colon. If her colon has already inert or she has something that caused the stool to delay and that she doesn't feel. So we have only one <coughs> case or more than this? More cases. I think we should move faster. We, we have yeah. many cases, but uh, maybe at least two. At least two. Okay. More, okay, much so more. For more information at that time, Professor Arun Silex Kinakot injection uh, at the anal coccygeal ligament. And two days later, Everything is improved, decreased pain, and <clears throat> uh, uh, after defecation. And at the same year, three months later, on October 2015, she reported that, okay, there is some better outcome after previous injection. And she went back to get a further injection. At that time, Professor Run chose a Botox injection. And so where, where, I stop where, here. Where, where, where stop was here, it stop injected? here. Stop here. Where was it injected exactly? So you may, you may ask question. Why you inject a uh, why you inject a uh, uh, steroid, and why you inject at uh, you know hospital recommend somewhere over there? In fact, I th I I think myself because I have many cases that maybe the spasm. Maybe because of the inflammation of the fascia that override the levator and I. So I, I check, in fact, I inject to the left here. will be inside above the this, this coccyx. I try to inject that area. With some improvement, after injection, she feel no pain at all. But still have some, some difficult defecation. And after that, she come back. And I inject Botox. I do not know where to inject at the time. I read many papers, but different outcome. So I inject Botox, but Botox very expensive. She, she do not have uh, enough money. So I inject only 20 units. But my injection is different. I inject posteriorly, maybe the same as the shooting. Uh, I inject posteriorly. Because we understand that all the elevator, especially the people like that list, Attached to the coccyx. In fact, it's not attached. But if you pull the if you pull the prebolactalis, the tension is at the coccyx. So I inject around the coccyx. I, I use only 20 units. The patient improved dramatically. She can go back. She lived normal life, without any smooth, without mucus. And when she come back, the ulcer heal. No ulcer anymore. That what my outcome. The problem is, after a few months, the problem come back. That the problem. Here we go next. So, uh, 
after October 2015, she went back again one year later. Uh, she report that uh, prop, uh, the symptom disappear for 10 months and it's recur again. So at that time, her bowel movement allowed 20 times a day, still difficult to pass to, even lose to, and more mucus, and same thing, she still need to use her finger to so evacuation proven. and use Point the proven. Right, this is the problem. Yes, this is the problem. And at that time, okay, uh, she got Botox injection again. And two days later, she feel better and the bar movement decreased to two times a day. The injection is bright, okay. Mm -hmm. It's not correct. It should be guided by EMG, yes. But I inject posteriorly near the insertion of the coccyx. I inject in that area. And on March, on November, she went back and okay, she got uh, the same treatment, Botox injection, and every time she will respond within two days. So this year, she came back on August of this year. She reported that everything still persists and uh, severe no pain, mucus discharge, still incomplete evacuation still need the finger to, to evacuation. And P, uh, per rectal examination, we found thickening of the anal rectal ring. Uh, this time, uh, we inject the Botox and advise about the puborectal wrist massage. This is the last visit uh, for uh, in our hospital. And Professor Arun want about the, to do something or any procedure to her, but she refused to get that procedure. What, what about biofeedback, mm -hmm. this patient? What about biofeedback? Yeah, she, she, she have the biofeedback before any treatment. She have that for a, a, a period of time, but no response at all. So this case is an uh, intractable uh, spastic of the levator ani. And if when I, last time when I feel it, the people like this, it feels thicker. It's soft. It's soft. Not, not, no, but it like a beak and something, it's more muscle, something like that. But uh, every time we inject Botox, she responds very well. But when we increase the Botox to 40 units one time, she feels very sick. I, I want to know what is the side effect of Botox injection. Do you have any side effect of the Botox injection? Do you have experience? Uh, side effect? No. Uh, when we read it, in the literature. If you've been injecting frequently, repeatedly, when we read obviously in the you have the trauma the, of the injection itself. The patient so may, may get feel some uncomfortable a few days. Maybe sick, maybe fever, something like this? Uh, fr from my experience that uh, uh, only, only several patients have the second time to the Botox injection. Mostly the only ones because they will have antibiotics from the Botox. The Botox, we can repeat often because Botox in China is very cheap. <laughs> the Botox here is very expensive. Especially in Bermuda, very expensive. That's not the price. That's only the result. The result only once. That's okay. No, I, I think this. You know, first of all, the question I want to give as a panel: Why do you think she recurred? Now, if she's well, she was well for 18 years, no problem. But now, why do you think she recurred? That's the question. Because if we answer that question, we can prevent it from recurring. I, I understand, in my understand, I, I, I would like to speed up the case. I understand that with the Botox injection, the muscle paralyzed and it's getting better. But Botox lasts only maybe one, one two months or three months sometimes. When the Botox lasts, the symptom again come back. That is my idea. Maybe it's not correct. Maybe it's not correct, but it's my thinking, my opinion. My, my, my question is this. Why do you think she recurred? I, I suggest, I suggest, again, I go back to the same basic point. You see, when she's well, she's passing one time a day. When the Botox, but she thinks, oh, I got to make sure I don't pass, I don't have problems. So she, she's probably taking a lot of fiber. That's why she, problem recurs. It's a recurrent problem. 
I see this all often. So when we get her well, she got to make sure her motion is small, little, less, so that she don't keep causing this problem. One way of preventing it. I, uh, one another thing which I do uh, uh, in some of the patients, uh, I've started using uh, Prucular Pride uh, along with the PEG solution, PEG-based solution. Because we don't want if you if you give if you give them bulk laxatives, you'll make the problem worse. Actually, the the bulk is actually contraindicated for this type of problem. So uh, Prucular Pride with uh, PEG-based uh, this PEG solutions, they really help in evacuating them. You know, when we look at the literature. The last resort of treatment, the treatment of the spastic levator ani, is the excision or partial excision of the pibolectalis. Anyone in the room have uh, ever heard or ever see or ever practice excision or, or incision of the levator ani? It doesn't work. So uh, about with force spasm, I, I have reviewed it come from stress and uh, because if she has, you saw, saw that when she go back to Bangladesh, she has stress, I think, maybe in her daily life and every time she comes to Thailand, she feel better <laughs> and so she has to move. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Prof. Lun has his own theory, Kasaya has her own theory. So we don't know exactly. Okay, before we stop this case, go to the second case, I would like to add more information. I have another case, very similar, the same age, everything the same, almost the same. He even got subtotal colectomy, uh, erectile anastomosis, improve only three, three months, and then come back, and then Botox injection, and then come back, and finally, I detached the levator from the coccyx. And now, she feel very good for two or three years now. She will get married next month. And this is made the final conclusion for me that detached the levator from the coccyx is my solution for this type of patient. And, uh, and you do it through the perineum? Oh, no. Detach it. Only small incision at the coccyx. Very small incision and detach it. Only local, in local injection. Yeah, through the perineum. No, through the coccyx. Yeah. Yes. Very easy operation. The same, the same patient. She just sent the mail to me. She will get married next month. And she thank you a lot for help her to solve her problem. Very, very interesting. There are two cases, but the last case, the next, the case that respond do not have solitary react. So, I think we better go to the next case. Are the, it's time. What is the time? Uh, it's the case from the Syrian hospital. Is 46 years old Thai female. She has the history of uh, no, difficult defecation for three years, but actually she has constipation for more than 10 years, and she's on regular use of the laxative. About three years after that, uh, three years before come to the hospital, she has uh, her symptom was worsened, and her she complained about the. She has no urge to defecate, and she can open her bowels only once a week if she uh, doesn't use any relaxative, and she feel a little bit bulging at her at her rectum. Uh, she has a history of the incomplete evacuation, and also she digitate to ease uh, defecation. Her stool was hard and a small palate, which is a um, Bristol stool type 1. She has no fecal incontinence or no urinary incontinence. Her underlying disease, she has no underlying disease. She's married. She got three, uh, uh, three pregnant and uh, two abortion. And she used to use the lots of laxatives and mostly uh, the Senna or Sinecot that you know. And sometimes she increased the dose to about eight taps per day. And she feel that 
it doesn't help her symptoms. So she discontinued the drug for about five years, and, the, and she changed to use the detox, which is the retrograde colonic irrigation with large amount of fluids, about two or three liters, and she used enema. And she has no history of the perineal surgery. Her physical examination, uh, her abdomen, abdomen was normal, and per rectal examination, there is normal sensation and good anal sphincter pressure, and there is no paradoxical contraction when we ask the patient to strain, and we can palpate the about three centimeters of anterior rectal seal, and there is no obvious uh, pelvic descent. And uh, at first, she come to the clinics, and we send labs, and all was normal. And and what should we do next with the these patients? So panels. Oh, 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 what was the pharynx sealed incision for? It was. Uh, so so her. Oh, may I have a look at the digital rectal examination? Okay, she can, she has the normal tone and oh, no paradoxical contraction. So, so usually in, in the case like this, with long term use of uh, it, laxative and enema, we have to ev and no urge to defecate. So she has, we have to evaluate her chronic transit time. Maybe with man manum urn. Now, now we have coronic manometry, but uh, the easiest one is the coronic transit study. She has long history of constipation altogether with uh, rectal seal. That means she she has uh, constipation with obstructification. Uh, so we have to investigate both sides: coronic transit time and difficult gram or MR difficult graphy. From our experience from MR difficult graphy, we found that all cases of rectal seal have a pelvic, some kind of pelvic floor descent. So any marker studies were done for slow transit constipation? It's been done? Marcus. Yeah, we think she has two components. Yeah, she has a chronic constipation with the obstructive oh, defecation. defecation. That's right. Yeah. So we sent her for the colonic transit time. In Sirat Hospital, we do the segmental colonic transit time. And the result on the seventh day is quite difficult to, uh, um, to interpret because on the, in the morning of the x-ray, uh, she feel very uncomfortable. Then she used the enema before the x-ray. So this is the result that we get. No, but, but even enema, she still has a lot of markers per <laughs> remains. Yeah. So it means her really have a colonic inertia. <laughs> uh, but how uh, for, for the period for evaluation, the, the basic uh, investigation, we, we use the elenorectal manometry. Yes, this is the retained marker. Then in the total colonic transit is about 98%, which, uh, 98 hours, which is abnormal. And we do the anorectal manometry, which, which is done by the gastroenterologist, and it was normal. And we also perform the difficult graphy because uh, it's easy to perform. And, we, and for the MRI, difficult graphy in Sirat Hospital is quite a long waiting time. And this is the difficult graphy. So, so I think in like this, the, the from manometry, her her defecation pattern is normal. Yeah, I see. But and from the physical graphy, I think the the rectal she has and she rectal seal, but I think she can empty it quite okay. <laughs> so, from the uh, difficult gram, uh, it shown the rash rectal seal and rectal anal intact subsection.
From this patient, I think mostly that's a slow transit constipation. Uh, actually, uh, she has the rectal seal, but she has a normal term, normal rectal, <laughs> a normal anal term. So we, we don't uh, to treat this. So mostly that's uh, because of the stena. So uh, we need to do the like uh, acupuncture and uh, yeah, motility, some some something, herbal medicine, yeah. Yeah, and we uh, we found there is a large anterior rectal seal and also rectal intercep uh, rectal uh, intussusceptions which is quite a high grade because it's in the uh, anal canal. And we do the colonoscopy as well, and it was normal. And what is the management of these patients? What would you do? So, so I, I agree with Dr. Ding that we, the, her main problem is her colon slow transit. So usually I have to sit with her and ask her <laughs> what if she really like to change, change her lifestyle back to no, no laxative. If like that, we, I we will plan the da daily, daily diary with her, what she has to do, like uh, fib what kind of fiber of food, water, exercise, and lifestyle, and which kind of laxative she can use. Usually I try to switch to another, uh, mm, con like new Ophanisia, the, the Stimulant, the other stimulant that may be not as strong as Senna, but, but it also help her to move the stool. I, at first, it might be difficult, so, but I think if we can try treat the chronic inertia first, it should be good for her. If she not respond to medication, I think we have to pay more attention, like more investigation for her colon, like we may do the chronic manometry for her. Now we can do. Yes, <laughs> Basically, she has a uh, main component is a slow transit constipation. And the other component is the, this thing. But the, manom the manometry is showing that she's able to evacuate completely, even without, uh, in, in spite of the interception and the uh, rectal seal, she's, she's able to evacuate on manometry. So I think we need to just treat the slow transit constipation first and see how she does with that. I would like to ask Kasaya and Dr. Ting, can obstructification syndrome cause delay coronic transit time? No, no. Obstructification, they will go every day. In fact, several times every day. And slow so, transit. from Chilawat uh, question, then the next question is, if you have delay coronic transit time, and at the same time, you have obstructification with either cause. Which problem you would like to attack first, the colon or the obstruction defecation? Which, which problem you would like to solve first? Uh, ask the Pardon patient me? which problem is bothering her more. Pardon me? Ask the patient which problem is bothering. No, no, no. Oh. We should have oh, no. we should have some basic idea. With 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 reason, we cannot ask the patient. We should have the reason how to manage this problem. No, no. I, you know, one of the things is this: before your pa the panel answer a question, I want to ask the panel: what is the incidence of rectal interception in normal patients? One question. Second question is, how many patients do you see with rectal interception that can pass motion normally? That's the second question. You know? And the answer is actually a lot. A lot of normal people have rectal interception when you do a, a, a difficult proctogram. So this may or may, or may not be a true problem that she's having. You know, so we blame it, but do we know what's normal? We don't know what's normal, you know. I agree. The problem is, if you have difficult defecation with hidden interception, a lactosil, and you solve this problem, <laughs> no, no, with others, uh, let's say DROM or any others, they still improve the defecation. 
they improve. Yeah. So uh, I know, I understand you, that this can be in normal people. But in people who have this problem and have the symptom, we should pay attention to this no, problem. If, if she has, if, if she had obstacle defecation also, like uh, uh, if the manometry is showing that she's able to evacuate, uh, if she was not, if the manometry shows that she's got paradoxical stimulation, uh, uh, contraction, then I would have said first do the biofeedback before, uh, before correcting the constipation. But otherwise, if you in a situation where they have both the problems, then I think the simultaneously they should be corrected. And the best option in this case would be to either do a, a ventral rectopexy, maybe a resection ventral rectopexy, something like that. So the constipation, at the same time you uh, hitch up uh, the, uh, 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 especially if she has a multiple, if she has a multi-organ also symptom like a uterine prolapse or a sister seal, then I think abdominal, uh, abdominal uh, surgery would be the best option for her. Maybe we ask uh, <laughs> because uh, she has two problems with uh, constipation and also obstructive defecation, which uh, from the evidence we know that there, there is a two, two part that we have to, to uh, treat. And at first we do the conservative treatment first. We give her the laxative, we give her uh, bucalopri and see the response and it was not that good because she was not respond to the bucalopri. And we also uh, uh, advise her to do the rectal gate uh, colonic irrigation, which she is very happy about it because at least she can defecate and she doesn't feel any uncomfortable at her rectum. So, and, but we do conservative about a year and then she feel her symptom getting worse. So, um, we think which component should we fix, whether the constipation or the obstructive defecation, or we will do both in the same operation. That's what we think. And for her symptoms, it's mainly obstructive defecation. So we solve the obstructive defecation first. We do a laparoscopic ventral rectopexy for that and then see the response. And we did it for about six months and her symptom improved and she used very little laxative and she can empty her rectum without defecation uh, obstruction. So I, I share you some ideas. Uh, long ago, I think everyone know. Long ago, I always comment that. Always comment that if you have obstruction ODS, either cause of ODS, for a quite a while, then you will have delay colonic transit time. And he said that if you have both problem, never attack the colon for problem first, attack, solve the ODS first. This is just a long idea. I just share his idea to you. I do not know. I just tell what I know from him. That's all. I, I, I share with you my idea. The colon is like a road. If there's a traffic jam, a narrowing, a road work, that's the point of problem. The traffic builds up behind it. The way is either you clear the, clear the jam, secondly, you don't add more traffic to the road. So the, again, the worst fiber. thing you can do is to add fiber because you have more, add more cars, more traffic jam. <laughs> because you guys, you guys need to know this. You, I mean, I tell you, I see a lot of patients like this and a lot of the 90% of them are cured by taking all fiber because then they have less tool, smaller tool, less problem. 90%. But, but I understand the technique to stop the, the fiber from my teacher. <laughs> I think he stopped the fiber by, by breakfast and then no fiber. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, that's all? Yes, that's thank all. You, thank you, Sira. Thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs> uh, we still have time, but do you want to stop? No, no. Do you know what? No? It's 20 minutes left. Okay, next. We have the next case.
Okay, this is the last case of today. Uh, she is a 68-year-old female presented with constipation and incomplete defecation. She has a history of prolonged episode on the toilet. She has uh, polyuria about 10 times per day and also the nocturia four to five times per night. She did herself a colonic irrigation every 10 to seven days. And uh, her Wexner ODS score is 13 and modified long course score is 14. On the, this is a digital rectal examination and we can see that on the left side. You can see that uh, she has an anti-rectal seal and this sent off all compartments. And the picture on the right side show that uh, she has a rectal prolapse with the enteral seal. She underwent the barium enema and showed the redundant sigmoid colon and the colonoscopy reveal the internal hemorrhoid and melanosis coli. This is an MR difficography. Uh, when she defecated, you can see that all three compartments are sliding down. And this is the result of the MR difficography. She has moderate widening of the urogenital hiatus with severe pelvic floor descent during defecation. She has moderate cystocil, severe peritoneal seal, and enteral seal, and also uterovaginal prolapse. And for the rectum part, she has anterior seal and full thickness rectal anal intersubception with small rectal prolapse. So uh, this is for the panels for this discuss of the management. No, no. We, before we start, I, I have one question first. If, if, if outside the hospital, maybe in other hospital, they do not have the MR difficult cam, and they do not have either the difficult coffee, so in those conditions, in that condition, what will you do? Maybe I ask the panel. If without difficult cam, what will you do? Refer, refer them to a place where there is difficult grammar yes, That's the easiest. <laughs> yeah, correct. And if it cannot be served, what do you do? Send the patient there. So you, <laughs> you also don't have difficult coffee, right? You, you, I think easy is this, you can do the transperineal ultrasound. You put the, the same probe as you do for the abdomen in the perineum and then you study. So you can also see like it, this. It's easier to do the difficult cam than the perineal ultrasound. <laughs> because perineal ultrasound in Thailand may be only one or two person who can perform it. Very, very. And I think in other countries it's not popular as well. Anyone do the perineal ultrasound here in our region? Maybe shooting one first and oh, from Songka, then we send many patients to. Uh, <laughs> To her. <laughs> okay, Chow, do you start putting your other side? Yes, Chow, the other one. So very few. So you see, we have more difficult cam than we, under putting your other side. We can directly do the digital examination. We can directly do the digital examination from the rectum and from the vagina at the same time. No, actually, actually the old fashioned method. You can easily just give a uh, you know a follow through a gastrographin follow through, oh. and you give you put uh, you put gastrographin in the rectum, ask patients to strain. You can do you can do uh, you know what, what we call uh, just screening you know, um, and you can see it, you know the radiologist can do it for you and just take pictures. You don't have to sit on a toilet bowl. They just put it. They can just strain. They can see. I ask you what. Can you can you make a diagnosis? of descent perineum without difficult cramp. Can you, by clinical, I think you can. Just explain to me. Yes. Uh, okay, I, I changed my practice. For the rectal examination, I f first take a look at the perineum descent or not. We, I ask the patient to strain on the left lateral position. If we saw the ballooning, that means there's some weakness of the levator muscle. In the more severe cases, the sphincter drop down after the ballooning. 
So and during rectal examination, we can demonstrate the uh, rectal seal, and then we open up the vagina. We can notice the movement of the cystal seal or urethral seal, and we can notice the movement of the uterus altogether. For the com overt prolapse, we can diagnose it all, but in some hidden cases, we cannot come pretty sure. It means that with clinical examination, you can tell that this patient has lactose prolapse with descent perineum or without descent perineum, with just clinical examination, and you do not need MRI. I think that's the message from Chirawat. Agree. Okay, next. Yes. Uh, actually, MRI is for study, and then it's a, a objective, not subjective evidence. Also, medical legally important to document it, you know, by MRI nowadays, because whatever surgery you do, if the results, you know, we don't have hundred percent results in all cases. At least the patient can say you are not done the MRI. So how do you know whether this is there? So for medical legal purposes. No, no. If the patient says that, you just say send the doctor Arun to your expert <laughs> witness. Then you say no need. <laughs> no, they will not send to me because it's expensive. <laughs> Not, I am very, very, very cheap. Uh, Arun very cheap, but the hospital is very expensive. <laughs> so as far as the management is concerned, since all the three compartments are involved, obviously all three will have to be fixed at the same time. Uh, if we give the patient the operation, we should do the MRI or ultrasound because that's we will avoid the suit. Yeah. Wonder, because I, I I never think that I never imagine that there are Sioux in, in in China too. <laughs> because it's different. Here we are very free to sue any person, but uh, in China maybe it's different, right? Yeah. Do you still have a to can sue the doctor in China? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't just sue. They come beat you up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In they beat you up. They, they come with knives and <laughs> yeah, they, they come and ki and kill you. In India, doctors come under the Consumer Protection Act. We have a Consumer Protection Act, and then doctors also are taken in that, so they can file in the Consumer Protection uh, Court. Uh, so it's very easy for them to do that. You don't require money to file a case. So coming to this management, all the three uh, abdominal. Uh, uh, sort of uh, rectopexy, ventral rectopexy, with hitching up the uh, bl the bladder and the uh, the vagina, the uterus uh, had uh, in this case, I think would be the solution. In this case, she tried Kikel exercise for three months, but the clinical does not improve. So we decided to perform the operation for her. The operation consists of four uh, four uh, uh, four steps. Uh, we perform the abdominal cystopexy and copopexy to correct the anterior and middle compartment. For the posterior compartment, we perform ventral rectopexy and closure of the deep cut sac and also the sigmoidectomy to correct the rear than sigmoid colon. This is a cystopexy. We mobilize the bladder and fix to the anterior abdominal wall. And this is a, a picture of the abdominal copopexy. And uh, the picture below is the ischemic graphic of the, showing the fashion of the cystopexy and copopexy. You can see that we fix in the different direction to allow the bladder to distend. The next step, uh, we perform the ventral rectopexy. Uh, because this case, we plan to perform the sigmo sigmoidectomy also, so we use the autologous tissue instead of the prosthetic mesh to fix the rectum. In this case, we have vest the tensor fascia lata from the lateral thigh and apply as in the same fashion with the mesh. The last step is to perform the sigmoidectomy. And this is the follow-up at six weeks. She still has some uh, urethral hypermobility from the examination. 
And at seven months, uh, her clinical significantly improved. The polyuria decreased to five times per day. And nocturia only one to two, two times per night. And she has no more constipation, no more soiling, and no more organ prolapse. Uh, physical examination revealed no wound complication. And in this case, we can avoid risk of mesh erosion. Her Wexner ODS score and modified Longo score significantly better. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. We have ten minutes left. And any questions from the audience? Any questions from the audience? Any comment, Tiranut? Any? I, I, I think like we have a. Uh, alcohol anonymous, we should have an ODS anonymous pa for patients where we make a patient group and then they can you know, talk among themselves, vent out all their frustration among themselves. You, you want to call the ODS patient to have a group to talk to one themselves? Their symptoms will multiply a million times. <laughs> <laughs> they will learn from each other. <laughs> no, but the thing is that they, would be, they will also be happy that we, they're not the only patient. You know, they have so many other patients also with like that. Them. Okay. Who knows? <laughs> That's the last thing you want to do. And any comment from the panels again? Okay. Okay. Thank you. The one who do the perineal ultrasound. <laughs> um, may I ask some question? I have uh, one patient with uh, lower rectal cancer, and now she is uh, on on going about uh, perioperative chemo radiation. But he has a uh, rectal prolapse too. Uh, what, what should I do after this? Lower rectal cancer that need coronal anastomosis and had a complete rectal prolapse. I'll just do it for free. Okay, just yes. Resection rectal pexy. <laughs> no, no, no. I, he, her, uh, she asked that uh, she need pre-operative chemo radiation, but the prolapse still maybe still have the problem with the prolapse. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Now, now she is on pessary during uh, during receive the chemo RT, but after this, she is, she refuses the hysterectomy or something like that. She think she 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 said that live with uh, pessary is okay. No, no, she, she, she needs an a anterior resection. Yeah, then, yeah. Then for, for, for rectal cancer. Yeah, the anterior resection will cure her rectal prolapse. Yes. Oh, just do anterior resection, just leave yes. it. I agree. <laughs> and, and I think uh, uh, this if patient, if this patient after the rectal uh, resection, rectal resection, after the rectal resection, they have the, uh, the patient has the prolapse, right? No, 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 haven't resected. Haven't resected. Oh, okay. okay. Not resected yet. Okay. I think the time is approaching, but I would like to stop here. And I would like to invite our, our dear speaker to stay with me here. And all the rest, you can go back home now. <laughs> Close. Well, um, for the general delegates, if you want to go to the gala dinner, please proceed to the pink elevator.